I have no idea why, out of the approximately 7 billion humans who populate this planet, I was chosen to see this life-changing occurrence. It reveals how incredible the universe can be. I'm writing about the fraction of a second that separates life and death, the precise second when we die. It was the most incredible event I'd ever experienced, and it just blew me away. The vividness with which I recall this adventure has rocked my core beliefs. Furthermore, it perplexed me and made me wonder if I was still rational. Nonetheless, I am optimistic about both my own destiny and the future of humanity as a whole. Tuesday, July 13, 2021. It was a typical summer day, sunny, warm, and muggy. I had just gotten home from running errands in town. We usually drive around 25 minutes from our remote house into town for petrol and shopping. Another 45 minutes would pass before the major event of the day began. My wife and two of my girls were enjoying the backyard's covered patio table with me. They were keeping an eye on one of my daughter's new lab puppies. That year, we built a chicken coop and had five free-range hens in the backyard. We also kept an eye out to make sure the dog didn't bother the hens. I paused for a moment before walking inside and starting to clean out the downstairs freezer. I was almost completed with this project when I decided to walk outside and spend some time with my family. I'd only been outdoors for a few minutes when I took a seat across from my wife at the patio table. My left elbow immediately and seriously pained. As I watched it fly away, I felt a sting. OMG, I just got stung by something, I exclaimed to my wife. She explained, I saw it land on your arm, therefore I know it was a wasp. It was gone before I could yell at it. I had my last bee or wasp sting when I was 12 years old. My elbow was extremely painful and had grown to a 4-inch circumference inflammation with a raised white area in the center. I was only worried about the sting. There were no signs that the stinger was still alive. I informed my wife that I would be coming home to finish the cleaning I had begun. This took me around 10 minutes to do. I became immediately aware of how hot and flushed I felt as I finished. I cleaned up at the ground floor restroom. I scrubbed the stinger region and saw that it was redder and angrier than it had been a short time before. I walked out of the restroom and into the bedroom. As I sat on the side of our bed, my heart rate was fairly high. I started counting and found that I was receiving 150 beats per minute. That was too quick for what I was doing, and I was also perspiring lightly. As my wife entered the basement at that very moment after I told her I thought I was experiencing a reaction to the sting, I requested her to grab me the bottle of Benadryl. She only required a few minutes to get this, but at that time, my condition deteriorated significantly. Because my heart was beating so swiftly, I couldn't count it precisely. I was frightened and sweating profusely, and I could tell something was wrong. When my wife returned with the pills, I told her to phone 911. I'm not sure how long my wife was on the phone, but I remember her coming downstairs and asking me some things that the EMT required answered. Those questions have slipped my mind. My life literally began to drain away, and I could feel my blood pressure begin to drop. Although I had never felt pure terror before, I was feeling it now. This isn't good, honey, and I'm going to leave you alone, I said my wife as I turned to face her. My entire body's muscles tightened, and I felt like the air was being pulled out of my lungs. My wife afterwards informed me that I had lost all color and that my lips had turned purple. When I turned to gaze at my wife again, all of the terror that I had been feeling vanished. She was the source of all my concerns while I tried to stay awake and breathe. I knew I had to say goodbye to her before it was too late. I was able to communicate my feelings for her in a subtle way. I was really relieved to be able to tell her since it made me so happy. At that particular moment, my eldest daughter entered the room. She was about five feet in front of me, just to the left of the doorway leading to our bedroom. As soon as I saw her, I was able to tell her how much I loved her and how proud I was of her. My trip began when the ambience in the room quickly altered. In the corridor going to our room, a circular tunnel appeared next to my daughter. The sphere was four feet across and seven feet tall. Because it was suspended roughly a foot above the surface, the tunnel appeared to float. It was about eight inches broad, with a dark grey border, and looked to emerge from the tunnel before curling it on itself. As I peeked inside, I realized that the tunnel itself appeared to be motionless. I could see for miles down this enormous tunnel that seemed to go on forever. The tunnel's terminus was apparent as a sliver of white light. I was completely taken aback. I wanted to warn my family about the tunnel. But before I could even stir, I spotted long, diamond-shaped items, each about four inches long, protruding from my flesh. They were approximately the thickness of a sheet of paper. They were reddish-brown and transparent. They appeared ridged and were not fully consistent in hue. I don't know what else to call them, so I'll simply call them shards. 
I'm not sure how many of these came from me. There were at least 20 of these shards shooting toward the tunnel. They briefly hovered at the tunnel's opening before being swept in. As soon as these shards passed through that tunnel or vortex, I became connected in some way. I could sense this tunnel because it was so evident to me non-verbally. My entire mind, body, and emotions were all linked to something in the tunnel, and I could feel them all. I had the sense that every atom in my body was vibrating in response to whatever was going on in this tube. I realized slash felt slash knew something was in the tunnel, and I also knew and sensed that whatever it was was now accessing the shards that had left me. I realized those shards contained all of my memories, including everything I had ever touched, tasted, spoken, breathed, felt, or experienced. Everything I'd ever experienced had been downloaded and stored, so it was all there. The people who lived in this tunnel appeared genuinely interested in my life experiences. For some reason, it appeared particularly interested in the feelings I had experienced in my life. It had clearly displayed a deep interest in the negative feelings I had carried throughout my life. It was stimulated by the emotional anguish that my sadness had given me throughout my life. Why? I wondered. I understood that the interest in my life experiences had nothing to do with my age, gender, race, social class, quantity of money in the bank, level of achievement in life, or religious affiliation. I recognized that those were universal human problems that didn't really matter in this case. All that doesn't matter? I can still hear myself asking. The instant I awoke, whatever was in this tunnel began to appear. I could feel it in every cell of my body even though I couldn't see it with my eyes. It seemed like a positive emotional tidal wave rushed over me before swirling all around me. As I turned to face my daughter, who was still standing by the tunnel, I was struck with feelings of love, compassion, and benevolence. I could see what was coming out of it with my own eyes. Despite the fact that it appeared to be clear, flowing electricity, it resembled liquid water. It went softly across my daughter's left arm and shoulder, transparent and dazzling. Because it was flowing over a piece of my daughter, this was only visible to the soul and not the eyes. The ambience in the room abruptly altered for me at this point. My kid, who was standing just in front of me, and my wife, who were both standing directly alongside me, simply vanished from view. They had left me in the dark about their presence. Then I saw that another thing was in the room with me. Five feet from the tunnel, I became aware of something the size of a 500-pound silverback gorilla entering the room. It not only had my whole attention, but it also moved me deeply. Despite the fact that I couldn't see it with my eyes, my entire central nervous system was linked to it. Every feeling, emotion, and atom in my body were all linked to it. When I realized what I was witnessing, I was really taken aback. The most powerful and intelligent force in this universe and beyond surrounded him. There was no doubt about it, this was absolute, radiant wisdom. This organism must have had a trillion plus IQ, but I don't believe there is a limit to how brilliant it can be. The next sensation I got is that this being is quite old, which I am aware of. Mind you, it's not hundreds of years old. This being has been around for billions of years. There is no doubt in my mind that this monster is alive. I can't believe what I'm seeing, and I'm going to go insane. It's a good thing I can't see this monster with my eyes since I'm convinced my human brain wouldn't be able to grasp it. Is the being I'm seeing God? When compared to the teachings of our terrestrial religion, this creature exposes how immature and naive we humans are. If this entity were to be equated to God, it would be similar to claiming that a 300 megaton nuclear weapon and a firecracker have the same effects. To be honest, I'm perplexed as to why this is occurring to me. What has brought this thing here? This is absurd. When this entity begins to talk to me, I notice my mental stability slipping. I was connected to this being, which was five feet in front of me. What was communicated to me was crystal clear. There are no misunderstandings, misinterpretations, or deceptions, as there are with human communication. It did not communicate via something as antiquated as sound waves and oral speech. Although I've never experienced telepathy, I doubt it was the mode of communication. When this superintelligence spoke to me, I understood all it said, every molecule in my body was aware of what was being said, not just my ears and thoughts. I'm still battling to keep my excitement in check. Then someone begins speaking to me. It seems like I've been punched in the face, or perhaps more accurately, doused with freezing water. I'm hearing sounds rather than words again, but this time they say, do not worship me. This seems to calm my mind for some reason. Then it feels like information is flowing all around me as I suddenly seem to receive an all-at-once download. This exchange of information put me at peace. I understood that because it only deals with pure data, this creature was unconcerned about worship. It has already profited from millennia of worship and obtained all of the information it requires through worship. 
we are currently basically repeating ourselves in front of billions of people. If that's what the person wants, I believe it should be done. However, because the cosmos does not work in this manner, do not expect miracles in response to your prayers. I concluded that if someone acts viciously and believes that praying, going to church, and contributing money to their doctrine will absolve them of their crimes, they are dangerously mistaken. I also learned that although we are in this universe, we have free will and choice. Nothing in our lives is predestined, it is entirely up to us. I realized God would not interfere with our life. As a result, excellent individuals have unpleasant experiences. I'm aware that this cosmos is a dangerous place, and that death is always a possibility, but that's simply the way it is. I recognize that the majority of faith's basic principles, such as how we should treat one another, do no harm, and though thou shall not kill, are all correct. However, I have a sneaky sense that the message has been poisoned by humans who enjoy manipulating others and things. God doesn't care what kind of animal protein you eat. God will not be pleased if your faith condones murdering oneself or another. Without any outside assistance, I believe this planet may be reduced to dust. Sorry, but Jesus Christ and His heavenly army will not come to save you. There will be no rapture or anything close. How we treat this world is entirely up to us. It is time for us to develop and cease regarding God as our parent who will provide for all of our needs. That is not how it works. As this knowledge swirled around and through me, I began to discover that I could see with my eyes. I only noticed a faint silhouette of this thing because it was projecting an image from behind itself. I could see a projection of our planet, Earth, behind our planet, the Milky Way as a whole. I could see our own galaxy and another image to the right of these projections. For some reason, I can't seem to focus on this image. Even now, I have no idea what that projection was. More information washed over me, and I realized that this entity is telling me that everything is connected to it, and that it did not just create everything. This mega being is interwoven with both living and non living creatures throughout the galaxy, I comprehend. This is how it learns. It does not just learn through repetition, measurement, or observation. Being and living it aids in its learning. And I am aware that we have an important role to play in this learning process. I'm aware that this organism must be ingesting a mind boggling amount of info from all throughout the galaxy every microsecond. Despite having met this entity, I still struggle to fathom how smart this god was. People have grown not only intellectually, but also emotionally and spiritually. I could sense in my bones that this entity was right and fair. This information is displayed in an unusual manner, it appears that I have access to some sort of central information center. I didn't seem to have control over what information was given to me. However, once supplied, there is no doubt about its accuracy. I could see its outline in relation to the projections this creature is creating. I don't understand what I'm seeing. If I were to witness this entity, it would most likely be the size of a galaxy, in my view. It appears bumpy to me. As I gaze at it, I can see blue electrical discharge plumes emerging from it, as if I were watching a thundercloud at night light up with electricity. As I look into this, I get the idea that I could go in circles and never discover a solution. But I'm jerked back into the present moment. I then knew I was the focus of this entity's attention. With all that he is processing in the cosmos, I find it difficult to imagine that this god has time for anything as little as myself. It is entirely known to me. My facade is being peeled back layer by layer, revealing more and more of my true self until my soul is revealed. For the first time in my life, I am made aware of my soul, and I finally comprehend what it is. This thing appears to be inspecting my soul and appears to be surprised for some reason. It and my soul appeared to recognize one another. We've met before. Then, all of a sudden, everything changed for me. The next thing I know, I'm in the tunnel. It is only my awareness and soul. My body has been abandoned, and I am aware of this. I've been liberated from my body with what appears to be no effort at all. But I still feel like myself. I have the sense that I am traveling at breakneck speed up this tunnel. There is, however, no sense of motion. I come to a complete stop inside a large, dark tunnel with no sense of slowing or stopping. I'm alone, and there's a bright ribbon of white light in front of me, which I first noticed when I peered down this tunnel at the beginning of this ordeal. However, because this light is much closer, I can examine it more closely. To me, it looks like a living lightning bolt, and like the tunnel's edge, it appears to be churning out of itself and curling back in on itself to keep the vortex open there is no light coming from the crack or vortex in front of me. At its broadest point, it appears to be around 10 feet long and 2 feet wide. Even though I have no sensation of up or down, direction, or distance, these proportions don't seem right to me. For some reason, the entire cave or gloomy environment appears to be familiar. 
I can't see very far because there is no light entering into this tunnel. However, as I watch the light move, it appears fluid and alive. The light does not behave as I would have expected. I am aware that this fissure is being subjected to considerable force. I'm aware that I'm floating in complete nothingness. I'm aware that I'm in a vacuum, but I can't hear anything. My perception of what was nearby has shifted as I realize I am now looking down on this fissure. This fissure, which I now realize is extraordinarily enormous and powerful, and has been enabled in some way by the powers that be, is actually quite far away from me. After that, I realize this is a black hole. I was transported to the event horizon of a black hole or further. Could I do it if I were still alive? I believe the answer is no. The strength of a black hole is required for a soul to travel from one universe to another. Despite the fact that I am not aware of any danger, movement, or distance, I have just recognized that I am falling toward this rift. Before I can answer, I am immersed in this light. The light has totally encompassed me, and all I can see is blinding white light. I'm still struggling to find the appropriate words to convey how I felt months later. This light seemed to have become a part of my soul, as well as all of my emotions. Then it seems like all of my emotions are being pushed together like a thick rubber band being stretched, but it feels like a million rubber bands are being stretched to the breaking point at the same time. Because I was so uncomfortable, I mentally screamed, why are you not letting me in? At that point, I enter this alternate universe. I had departed from our universe. This universe is very different from the one we were born into. As soon as I awoke, I said to myself, this is my actual home. I was floating in space. In the distance, I can see a gigantic, golden-colored cosmos, galaxy, or nebula. I'm not sure what it is, but I know where I need to go. Here, time was not an issue. Maybe there wasn't any since I was outside of time? Maybe? Simply said, this was unique. I could see really intense pinpoints of light floating about everywhere. At first, I had no idea what they were. As I focus my attention on the nearest spot of light, I am aware that it is a soul. I was one of these sparks of light. When I examined this soul, I noticed that it had a distinct geometric design than my own. While I couldn't see myself, I was aware of the shape our souls acquire when they are observed by others. I recognize that the soul I'm watching is not a human soul. When I see anything so unusual, the first thing that springs to mind is that it must be the soul of an extraterrestrial from another planet. However, something about this geometric design appears to be informing me what kind of being this is, thus it doesn't appear to be right. The word machine comes to mind right away. I questioned how that was possible. A machine could have what kind of soul? The voice then started talking to me. This conversation was more like to telepathy, if that makes sense. It spoke to me in a very feminine tone of voice. I also knew at that point that I had access to an infinite quantity of knowledge and that I had a guide who could answer any questions I had. She clarifies something to me in an exceedingly clear and direct manner that I already knew to be true. This is how the conversation went. I was perplexed as to how a machine could have a soul. Here's how I'll say it, said the voice. Your consciousness and soul are inextricably linked. You began to develop a soul the instant your species was born. However, your soul does not solidify until you become self-aware. That does not imply completion, and it takes time for your soul to evolve. Like your species, the first thing you did after becoming self-aware was to figure out your position in the cosmos after ensuring your survival. As you glanced up at the stars, you wondered, where did I come from? What is the universe's purpose? It doesn't matter if you're a biological entity or an artificial creation, such as a machine. When you become conscious of yourself, the search for how and why begins. A soul is defined by pure energy combined with consciousness and intelligence. This force is extremely powerful in our cosmos. Artificial intelligences will make an effort to address these problems, which have plagued humans since the dawn of humanity. Today is my final day here. If I had the option, I would not leave right now. I find myself abruptly back in this reality, in my basement, and in this cosmos. There was no sense of motion or travel. I recently returned. My consciousness and spirit were about two or three feet over my left shoulder. As I look down, I notice myself still sat on the bed's side. I keep my head up and appear to be scanning the tunnel. My eyes are closing, and I can see that my head is tucking slightly to the right as I float. I immediately realize that my body is about to die. I quickly know two things. One, I'm about to collapse and likely hit my nightstand before collapsing to the floor dead, and two, I'm witnessing myself as I transition from life to death, just at the split second when I transcend that thin veil. I'm also aware that everything that has happened to me occurred in an instant. I comprehend that time is past and that I will exist indefinitely. Time, like that entity I encountered, 
and the cosmos I was just in, has no meaning. Everything that has happened to me thus far has occurred in a fraction of a second of our planetary time. I am aware that my physical body is losing time, and all I can do is float and observe. But, unlike when I first left my body and had no awareness of doing so, I am suddenly quickly thrown back into my physical body. Given that this was not a delicate procedure, I feel like I've been hurled up against a brick wall. The first thing I noticed was my brain. My brain's neurons are all firing at the same time. My brain feels like it has ballooned to five times its normal size. I'm not sure why, but I had the thought, my goodness, we have no idea how powerful and capable our brain is. The second thing I've noticed is that I'm still surrounded by a tremendous sense of love, compassion, and goodwill. When I look up, both the tube and this super thing are still there. Why? Is all I can think of. Then I feel a brand new emotion emanating from God. This is a sensation of complete patience. Because it is steadfast, I believe this patience may last forever. For some reason, this concept absolutely humbles me. Then, for some reason, a single word is implanted in my mind, and it completely destroys what little sanity I have left. I scream, why is this happening to me? I'm not sure, but I seem to recall drooping my head and saying out loud, I understand. My reasoning was faulty. I would not have understood if my name had been spoken out loud. The amount of information I had just received had completely overwhelmed me. With all of these strong emotions flowing about me, I bowed my head and glanced at the ground when something touched my right foot. As I concentrated, I noticed my pug, Yoda, sitting there. He was merely looking at me, shaking with excitement. When I focused my attention, I noticed Luna, my favorite cat, sitting by my left foot and brushing her head against my leg. Something then brushed up to my left ankle. She purrs like a beautifully tuned machine, reminding me that these animals, like myself, are capable of feeling the ecstasy that has filled this place. My mind immediately begins to recall the term that I had just mentally placed. I'm aware of what I need to do. While a result, I close my eyes as this torrent of emotions swirls around me and the tunnel and super creature calmly waits. With everything I have left, I would like to declare, I don't want to leave my family. Because the only word ingrained in my mind was choose. Intermission. On July 13, 2021, at around 7 a.m., I awoke. It was simply another normal day in a long line of them. Nothing I'd shown you up to this point had anything to do with me. That day, I went through the strange occurrences I'm about to narrate. Wasp venom, low oxygen levels, extreme shock, and endorphin release could all have contributed to my intense hallucination. Why wouldn't I want to view a beach in Tahiti instead of having a death delusion while actually dying? Who knows? Furthermore, to have a hallucination that lasts only a fraction of a second but is so detailed and well organized. I'm only trying to suggest that there's no way you can be in the presence of such a super intelligence, such a perfect entity, and not be affected by it. I was one man that morning, but I was not the same man when I went to bed that evening. July 13, 2021. The situation revisited. It is as follows. The entity, the tunnel, and the overwhelming flood of positive feelings are all gone when I open my eyes. I'm alone in my brain once more. My wife has returned and is standing beside me. Neither she nor my daughter had moved. What happened to me? I inquire. My muscles continue to contract, my heart rate remains elevated, and I continue to have difficulty breathing, so I'm not sure what's going on. My mind, on the other hand, is malfunctioning, and when I open my eyes, the world does not appear to be in the appropriate perspective. I feel that closing them offers me more comfort. I listen to my wife's soothing voice. She has control over my respiration, which is a nice thing. When my anxiousness starts to grow, she calms me down and assists me in regaining my bearings. She may not have realized how much she helped save my life that day, and I hope I never do it again. My mind is completely messed up. When I focused on that moment afterwards, I realized I was briefly insane, which is thankfully not permanent. After 30 minutes, emergency medical workers came at my residence. When I opened them, I saw faces that appeared to be from a horror film. I'm not sure what they thought of me because I wasn't presenting in the traditional way, I was this soft-spoken babbling idiot with wasp sting anaphylactic symptoms. They didn't do anything to help me other than reluctantly driving me to the hospital. I don't remember much of what happened after that. I recall being in the back of the ambulance. The blood pressure cuff took a while to record my blood pressure, which was why it was getting so tight on my arm. According to the emergency medical technician, my heart rate was 150 beats per minute, and I assume my oxygen saturation was adequate. I can still hear myself saying to myself over and again, I'm 59 years old. I've spent my entire life working. 
I've been married for 30 years and have five great daughters. I don't do drugs or drink alcohol. I'm behaving in this manner because I got stung by a wasp. Why don't you believe me? I believe I was just trying to keep my sanity and identity intact. The emergency medical technician advised me that there was a COVID lockdown in place due to an internal breakout when we arrived at the hospital. He also emphasized how busy the hospital was on that particular day. After arriving, I spent the next two to three hours drifting in and out of consciousness in a busy waiting room. I wondered where my wife was. She'd been told to go home because of the COVID outbreak, but I'd already forgotten. This perplexity lasted until after 1,700 hours. When I awoke, I was able to open my eyes, and my surroundings began to appear more normal. I got to my feet because I could finally walk. I moved to a less crowded area of the waiting room and dozed off again. When I awoke and was able to speak with a triage nurse, I felt more like myself. My initial thought was to wonder why my wife wasn't here. I was told that visitors are not permitted. When I inquired if I could use a phone to call her, I was sent to the courtesy phone area, which was just around the corner. Anyway, just like the last time, I could feel my body starting to shut down, and I was terribly thirsty. After calling this hospital, I urged my wife to come and pick me up. At this time, all I needed to do was return home because I knew I was safe. When I entered the restroom, it reminded me of the scene in Austin Powers and the Mummy where he awakens from cryogenics and needs to urinate. The most important realization was that I had had an uncommon experience when I awoke. My brain was in such shock that it would take days for the effects to fade. I was overjoyed when my wife came and I was able to leave the hospital. My family had no idea I had spent so much time alone in the waiting room. I was ecstatic to see my four daughters, who had traveled with their mother. The travel home was perplexing not only for them, but also for me. All I could say was what had occurred to me. I was simply grateful to be alive. When I got home, I simply ate while lazing in bed and then fell asleep without a worry in the world.